The Governor, I think, was the biggest budget New Zealand television um, production ever at that time. I, I know that my, my memory's not great for figures, but I think I think it was a million bucks or something, which was huge in New Zealand television at the time. And um, it was only the second time I'd been on camera. I, I'd done a few stage plays, but so I was really very much of a novice. And I got handed this this you know role of of Sir Richard Seddon, and um, you know, I had to I had to do a, a lot of quick research because I wasn't huge on New Zealand history. But um, uh, I, I got that, and uh, I, I don't have a lot of memories of it because it's so long ago. I, the one thing I do remember is that they, at great expense, made three costumes for me because there were I think there were three different time periods, and when we got to location, and I, I'm sorry I can't remember what that location was, two of the two of the suits had gone. So I think I played the whole thing in the in the one in the one costume. That might tell you something about how things were organised in the early days of New Zealand television. But um, I, I, I just remember people people going crazy searching for these <coughs> expensive suits that had been made. Period costume, and uh, they were gone. I was only in it for five minutes, but it was my first feature film role. So that you know that was significant for me, and I. I I think it was Jeff Murphy's first proper feature film as well. So, you know, um, and they, it was offered to me. I didn't, I didn't have to um, audition, you know. I'd done a bit of stage and television and got off it. So I was delighted to do that. Um, and and I, I was flown down to Wanaka, I think it was. And growing up in Lower Hutt, and then Wellington, I, I, you know, I'd barely seen the South Island, so that was all new to me. And um, I had to go, I remember I was driving a car where I had to be, you know, the, the main character was in a mini, sort of a, you know, chase around around New Zealand. And, and I was a cop trying to pull them over and I was sideswiping the mini and having to speak through a, um, uh, you know, a loudspeaker, <coughs> yelling at them. And I was being filmed by a crew who were sitting on the back of a, a truck. And I didn't realise this till later, but they, you know, you know, be, I was so focused on what I was doing, I was, and I'm swinging the car like this. They said I was this far from going over the cliff. We we're, we're, were driving along these massive steep cliff roads and they, they said, my God, we all thought you were going over. I had no sense of danger at all. I was just focused on what I was doing. But um, so I, I, my, my career could have come to quite an, quite an early end. Uh, what I remember mostly about Came a Hot Friday was being completely in a, in, a, in a bubble, you know, just thinking about my own character. It was, I think it was the biggest character I'd been asked to play in a film at that point. And um, so I was really focused on that. And a lot of stuff was going on in the film that I, I've only found out about later. You know, I, I know Ian had a struggle about, you know, how to present it, and he finally decided that he was going to emphasise the comic elements, and that really, really, you know, ended up working for the film. But <clears throat> I don't remember any of that. Um, I just remember being being focused on trying to get this character right, and sort of staying in character quite a bit. I think between takes, I do remember Mune saying to me at one point, "Could you just smile occasionally?" A lot, a lot of these extras think you are that guy, you know, and. Uh, which, which I put down to insecurity on my part at the time. I just wanted to hang on to the character and, you know, I, I, I know a lot more about, you know, acting now, but I, I was actually relatively young and relatively inexperienced, but uh, I just wanted to sit in there. The Navigator is, you know, I have to start out by saying an extraordinary film. I mean, I really, I really like the film, um, but just absolute chaos, you know, on set. Just actors being called and being being held around for hours without being used, and actors will always bitch about this stuff. But I mean, this film took it to a whole new level, um, and you know, frustrating for the crew as well because they, uh, you know, schedules changed by the minute and call times were never appropriate. And uh, you know, you'd you'd be setting up for one scene and uh, you'd have spent a couple of hours maybe rehearsing it and they'd set up the lights and suddenly another scene was being shot over here and there was no real rational explanation given for any of this. So, you know, that was a, that was, that, that was a chaotic um, uh, experience and a frustrating experience for a lot of people. But 
I do think the, the final film is remarkable. Uh, it could have been better, I think, if they'd organised it better. I, I remember there were scenes that they just, because we ran out of time, couldn't shoot. There's one scene in particular, I remember, where I had to run amok on a bus that I was, uh, I was really looking forward to shooting, and we never got to it because they, in the end, they were just tearing up seaweed. No, we can't do that, we can't do that, we can't, we've gone over time. So, you know, that was sad, it was unfortunate, but, um, you know, I, I, I have to speak highly of the end result. It was, it, it was one of the more interesting films I've done. I played the same character, but they, they decided, I think after my character was dead, that he had been living a lie and was actually, uh, <laughs> He changed his name. That's all. That's why there's two names attached to that. But, but as far as I was concerned, I was playing one character the whole time. The longest job I've ever had as an actor, and I, I chose to drop out eventually because you can just get trapped into those. And I think I was there four years or so, four and a half years. Um, but it was kind of surreal. I mean, I'm, I've lived most of my life, my adult life, in cities. And, and I'm being flown in from Sydney, you know, every week or so to, to um, put on a hat and pretend to be a farmer and um, then fly back to Sydney again, you know. And, and uh, the, the, the strange thing is when you do a show like that, people identify you, you with a character. So I'd have country people coming up talking to me as if I was a farmer, you know. I know nothing about farming in reality, but, you know, acting is is illusion you know you 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 know if they thought i was a real farmer i'm very glad that's my job you know my nephew james um wrote and directed it and edited it actually i think he may even have written the music as well so he's he's a bit of an all-rounder james um so yeah i did that because he offered it to me and i wanted to help him out on his first film and um i, w I was very happy to do that was, that was like three days i think i i did all my scenes he flew over from, um, I think I was doing a television show in Melbourne at that time, and three days to come over and play this very unpleasant character and uh, fly back again. Well, again, it was one of those ones where I was, I was in a play at, at night, and that was all being shot in the day, and, and my agents come up and said, well, this is, I, I think it was only you know, four days or something, and you can fit this in with the play. So you, you get out, and I was playing a politician, and um, I remember there was a lot of dialogue, so I, I, I had to learn, I had to learn a lot of dialogue before one of those days. It was, it was a big scene around a table where we were all talking a lot, but, um, um, and I, I do remember being in the makeup room and they had some uh, wonderfully grotesque, makeup for these these characters who were coming down with um virus their faces were falling apart but um uh i remember i remember being impressed looking at the stuff they had set up there I thought some very nice makeup work there um unfortunately they didn't get to apply it to me i was meant to be in two episodes only uh, playing this enormously fat cop who dies of a heart attack and um they decided they liked the character and wanted to keep him in. So I didn't, I had the heart attack, but survived. And I had the, this huge prosthetic gut on me. And um, I, I think it was reasonably, me. You know, my, my own weight goes up and down. So I was reasonably big at the time, but they put, they added to it with this huge gut. And when they brought me back, they, they left a few episodes and I came back after having recovered, they decided to drop the gut. And I just came back, you know, in my own form. But, um, he, he was sort of a, uh, you know, a um, you know, hard, hard nosed uh, Australian cop type character. But, uh, you know, he was, um, they, they, they humanized him a bit when, when they brought him back, which is what they do with long term characters. But in the, in the, in the original, uh, the original storyline, he was just a complete prick. But, and I think people would have been very glad to see him die. But, um, you know. Um, so, so I went on and did about two, two or three series of that, I think. It's a tough life and it's, a, it's, it's been a struggle at times, but um, I think for those of us who, who've stayed with it, you know, it's, it's got to be, a, it's got to come from somewhere deep in you. You don't, you don't stay with it unless it, you know, unless it means something to you. I know there are people that go into acting and, um, and they may be talented. It's, it's, it's not about a lack of talent, but they don't have the, the commitment or the, or the, uh, you know, the passion to stay in it. 
because once they find out what the life is really like, it's pretty rugged sometimes. And uh, so there's a high dropout rate, you know. I've, uh, I've kept going, and so I, I, I realise I've kept going because it must mean something to me, you know. And uh, I'm happy with that.